Okay, welcome to digging into open source GIS for archaeology, five practical examples. Um, I'm going to run through a lot of material today, um, sort of give you a background on what we do when we work with um, a number of archaeology companies. Um, I hope this will be helpful. Um, I hope, especially for anybody who's sort of thinking about migrating to open source GIS, who already or already uses it, and looking to maybe a, migrate towards a database. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of material here, so I'm just going to dive right into it. I'm just going to turn off my camera while I'm presenting. All right. So a little bit of background uh, about our company. Uh, Luna Geospatial specializes in open source GIS. Uh, we provide consulting and training. Uh, we work with uh, many open source GIS pieces of software, uh, QGIS, PostGIS, GeoServer. Um, we do a lot with Merge and Maps also now for mobile data collection. Um, we do remote sensing, training, support. We also do software development. Um, this is one of the main things that we do. Um, we build custom software uh, for um for people, we build uh, dashboards, web GISs, um, any database driven application is really something that we can um, build for you. We also serve uh, GIS servers. Uh, we build and manage cloud based servers. Uh, we provide backup, support, training. Um, we set, we build sort of custom databases for clients, um, kind of like the ones that you're going to see today. We also have Lunamap Enterprise, which is a web-based uh, GIS platform. Uh, we install it on our, on our cloud-based servers for our clients, and it just gives you access to everything that you have within your Postgres database, everything that you have within GeoServer. You're able to access that on the web, build custom maps. Um, we, we're really sort of anti-SaaS in a way, so we really give you unlimited everything. Basically, it lives on your own private cloud, so you can do whatever you want. Um, you can have unlimited maps, you have unlimited workspaces, unlimited users of any type, whether they're editors or admin or um, just standard end user viewers. Um, we're very transparent with our pricing as well. And right now we are doing an early adopter program, which is going to be on until September 1st, 2024. Uh, so if you just want to know about pricing, uh, my email will be at the end of this presentation. So you can uh, send me an email and I'm glad to give you a demo and walk you through this if you're interested. Um, the other thing to note is um, some of you, uh, you know, found out about this webinar through our, our newsletter. Um, we don't spam people. We send maybe, you know, one out every few months or so. Um, but if you want to, you know, keep up to date with some of the things that we're doing, please sign up for the uh, newsletter and we will send you that as uh, they become available. All right. So webinars. Um, we have um, we have done a lot of webinars in the past, um, and they're always available online. Uh, you can go back and see any of our previous webinars um, through our website. Lunar Geo Learn. Um, if you're looking for training, um, we we provide extensive training for things like PostGIS. So if there's anything in this webinar where you're like, oh, I'd like to know more about that, um, definitely check out our training um, options. Okay, the intended audience for this. Obviously, archaeologists, um, archaeologists who are interested in open source GIS. So if you're already working with it or you're looking to enhance it a little bit more within your organization, um, this will be a good webinar for you. Those considering migrating to open source GIS. So maybe you're using proprietary GIS uh, and you want to sort of you maybe you've dabbled a little bit in QGIS and you want to sort of go all the way in and start using this technology. Um, this will be a good webinar for you. Those considering upgrading from a file based to a data based um, um, GIS. Uh, we get this a lot. I think this is the vast majority of clients that come to us are not on, you know, another sort of proprietary solution. They might simply just be um, looking to migrate from a file-based system to a database um, system. So we help out with that process. Um, we also help out teams. Um, we're, we're sort of targeting teams who are looking for, for this sort of multi-user editing environment. Um, so this uh, usually comes back to the file-based systems, right? If you don't have that multi-user editing environment set up, um, this will give you a good idea of what you can do with this technology. So after a brief introduction, we're going to dive into what, you know, part one, centralized databases, and we'll talk about those. We'll talk about multi-user editing. We'll talk about GeoServer integration, um, QGIS print composer, and some of the things that we can do with that. We're going to talk about Lunamap Enterprise integration. I'll just show you how all that kind of connects together and how you can serve things out from your database right to your um, to your map. And then we're going to conclude, and I'll give you a couple of points to go home with and to think about. All right. 
I wanted to start with a demo. I usually do this because I think it makes sense if you sort of see the whole thing in action before I explain to you all the bits and pieces in it. Um, so if we go into uh, QGIS, I'm just going to run through. The database I set up is kind of a mix of every database you're seeing today. So it's not really the greatest representation. I would usually split this up into multiple databases. Um, but what you're looking at is a combination of like the GIS database. So things like all of your boundary data, if you wanted to load um, something like the geographic boundaries, uh, sorry, geographic townships for Ontario, Canada, um, you can load them. And you notice when I load it from the database, this is a Postgres connection, right? When I load it, we have that default symbology. Well, we can set that and store that within the database. Um, likewise, we can go in and we can load, you know, fairly large data sets too. And QGIS handles this quite well, quite elegantly, I would say, um, when loading these things. We can load um, municipal boundaries, things like this, um, even large data sets, large and very complex data sets like soil data sets. Um, we can load those into um, and save the default symbology into the database. So already you can see that if your users were connecting to this, you know, they can either have read-only access, they can have editing privileges, they can have admin privileges on these data sets, uh, but they'll simply be able to load them and they'll be given that sort of default um, style. Now, another thing we can do, which is kind of cool, is we can store projects within the database. And this is something I'm going to show you as we as we go on. So um, this is a project that was stored. So you can actually store your QGIS projects centrally within the database. Um, and this allows you to share them with staff internally, um, or you're able to um, do things like, uh, um, uh, you know, save different templates centrally and just have them open them and then save them to their own projects. And that's kind of what we did here where I have all of our project areas. So let's just say these were project areas. And all of this is fake data, of course, that I'm showing you, none of this is, is real. Um, as we zoom in, we can see that we have this Tucker Farm project that occurred um, in this location. Uh, so this is showing us all of ours, but if we wanted to show one that was just one specific project, like the Peters Farm project, we can maybe create another schema, and this is called a schema within the database, and we can open up just this one project. Now, what's cool about this is that as we zoom out, you're not seeing anything else, right? You're not seeing any of the other data sets. And this is because all of the data is centralized within these uh, main tables here, these project tables, right? So we have artifacts, project areas. There's a staff table that's non-spatial that we just use as like a lookup table. There's a survey grid. Um, and there's a test pit table and there's a bunch of lookups and things like that to go with it. But why is it that we're only seeing a portion of the data and the portion associated with the Peters Farms? That's because we've sent um, filters. So for every single layer, we know the Peters Farm project is you know, number 197. Um, so as we do this, we can see that the ID value here is 197 and we're using that as a filter for every single layer. Now, what's really neat is that if we go in and edit, we can even go in and say, all right, well, I'm going to add a new uh, point or a new test pit to this project. Automatically, the default value is set to the Peters Farm project. You can't even edit that. So if you're working in the Peters Farm project and you're putting down a test pit, automatically it's going to be associated with that project. Now, this is only the tip of the iceberg of what we can do with this. We can also create things like custom QGIS plugins, um, where you start a new project and it replicates all the tables. Um, there's tons of stuff that we can do here to, to sort of streamline that whole process of creating a new project. Okay, let's close this for now. And I'm gonna dive back into explaining to you kind of how we set all of this up. All right, so through this talk, we're gonna talk a lot about data integrity and how this is important, especially when dealing with sensitive cultural data. Um, and how if you're storing this on a file system, it's simply not secure. It's not safe. Anybody can make a copy of it. Um, anybody can accidentally delete portions of the data. Um, you know, bad things can happen quite easily when you're dealing with files on a file system. So I'm often going to, to, to discuss the you know, difference between a file-based system, and that's just a bunch of shape files sitting on your file share, and everybody opens them and creates maps with them or creates copies of them, which is even worse because you end up with duplicate data all over your server, and you never know which one is the real parcel data set or when it was updated or it, you know, what changes were made and by whom. 
um, as opposed to a database where we can track all those things. That's what a database is built to do, um, to manage uh, data editing, to manage data. We're going to talk also a little bit about raster management planning and some things that you can think about um, for your specific organization. We're going to talk about streamlining um, cartographic production. So really using QGIS and all the features that are within it. And I'll just highlight some of the ones that I know that a lot of the archaeology companies we work with um, are using. And then I'm going to talk about sharing internally and externally. Okay. I want to give you an idea of how these servers are set up. Um, so whenever we set one of these things up for a client, um, we start with Postgres and PostGIS. Postgres is the database, man database management system, while PostGIS is the spatial extension for Postgres. Um, this creates a spatial relational database management system. We always install GeoServer. So GeoServer allows you to share geospatial data on the web through a variety of standard services like WMS, WMTS, WFS, and so on. So both QGIS connects to both, connects to the database, connects to GeoServer. Um, if you're serving a bunch of raster data through the GeoServer, you can load that uh, into QGIS. Likewise, I just showed you, we can load all the layers that we have uh, stored within Postgres. We can load those directly within QGIS. Now, Q this doesn't mean you're not going to use your file system anymore. You'll always use it, especially if you're doing analysis. If you're doing analysis on a bunch of you know large terrain files and, and working with something, you're still going to use the file system on your computer. You're still going to use your network. Um, you might still have things like uh, a project folder that's filled with PDFs and Word documents and whatever else you, you have collected, photographs from the field, things like this. That will still exist within the file system and you'll still interact with those um, data assets. Now, this is served out to staff. Staff has a QGIS, uses QGIS and can connect to the database and to GeoServer and access everything. They might also use Mergent Maps if they're going to be doing any field data collection. And this is going to make them happy because everything is going to sync right to Mergent Maps. And then we're able to sync that right back to the database. Um, so we have a couple of tools that we can build and we can grab your stuff from Mergent and pull it in. And there's a bunch of magic that we can do um, on the back end. And this is where LunaMap comes in. So LunaMap is a web-based web mapping platform, and it allows you to pull data, again, directly from your central source, your Postgres and your GeoServer, and show it on the web. Something that should be very, very obvious right now is that we keep our data central. Um, we're not having copies of our data floating around. We're not making different versions of the data and, you know, certain staff members will have that and then they'll like check it back into the database or anything. No, you're connecting directly to that centralized source. LunaMap is too. So LunaMap is great for staff as well. Um, if you want to go in and quickly check something, you can log into LunaMap and see all your layers and search for a specific project area and load it uh, and find whatever information you're looking for very quickly. Um, if you're a non-GIS user, it's especially helpful because you're able to go in and see whatever you need to see. Now, this is also good for clients or other project participants or other people who have an interest in the project and should be able to see some of these data, perhaps as they're being collected. Um, and with LunaMap, you're able to create these users who can log in. So everything's secure. All your layers are secure behind a, a paywall and they can log in and they can get access to the data that they have permission to view. So I wanted to show this just as, as a layout so you understand kind of how we set this up. So when we go into talking now about setting up different databases, we're talking about actually setting things up within the Postgres server. Okay, so let's talk about centralized databases. All right, so why is a file-based uh, GIS bad uh, in a multi-user environment? Well, there's many reasons. Here's a couple. Um, there's no concurrent editing. You can't open up a shape file and have somebody else open up a shape file and both edit and add a point and press save. Inevitably, somebody is going to overwrite somebody else's work or the file system is going to simply lock you out. There's no data auditing or version control. It's very easy to overwrite work completed by other users. You have duplicate data. It's going to happen. You're going to make a copy of that parcel data set and store it on your own local. And you have no idea where it came from or when it was downloaded. Um, there's limited automation um, when you're using um, a file-based system. There's no user management. Um, there's no you know, granular permissions that you can assign to different users. Um, really, there's limited permissions. You're either read or you're read-write. 
um, and that's established on the network side. And that has to have, you need to have some sort of IT person who sets this up so that a folder is only readable by certain users. Um, and there's also networking issues, especially as more and more of us are working from home um, or in, in the case of archaeology, working in the field. Maybe you're checking in when you, um, you know, get back to a hotel or something. You need to be able to access these data if you're going to be storing them in a centralized place. Um, so with a file-based system, it's a lot more difficult to connect to these resources. You need some sort of VPN firewall set up. Um, there's also always a problem with large files. I have this quite often where somebody tries to send me something via um, you know, SharePoint or Drive, um, and it won't download as a single file. It'll download as a series of zips, and it's just a whole um, series of mess. All right, PostGIS and QGIS for archaeology is a really nice solution, and this is something that we've done for many um, clients. We often first start with building a GIS data warehouse. This is a central source for all your third-party data, um, your data, data for your entire work area, so your country, your province, your state, your district, wherever you typically do work, we can load this into um, the database. It's read only for most users. So again, this is a third party stuff. So the example that you're seeing here is we have a series of 14 different schemas. That includes a map schema that might just be some default maps that you put in there and the public schema, which is default for any database. Um, but with it, you see within the boundary schema, you'll have things like the geographic township uh, layer, the lot fabric, the municipal boundaries for both lower tier and upper tier. Uh, and, you know, the list could go on and on. But at least you know that all these data are centralized and that everybody, if they're loading up a municipal boundary layer or a parcel data set, they're all pulling it from the exact same location. We can establish default symbology. I, you showed, I showed you that in the demo. Um, and it's centralized, read-only uh, GIS projects. So think base maps. Think is, okay, if everybody's going to be creating maps, in the map schema are gonna be a bunch of templates that you can use. They have our print layouts, they have a whole bunch of things um, for users to um, access. So how do we create a project database? So that's great for third-party data. It's, you know, it's file system, right? It's, it looks and feels like it, except, except it's obviously more secure. Most people are reading the data. What about project data? That's very different. We have a bunch of different solutions for this. Um, we have a project by schema model. This is the most simple um, of solutions where you basically create a different schema in the database. Think of a schema sort of like a file folder, but I often get into trouble when I say that to people because it's not like a file folder. It has a number of objects that live within it. Um, and uh, so the basic approach, as I said, is creating a schema per project. Um, tables are replicated for each project. So you can imagine if you have a project boundaries table, a test pits data, artifact collection, et cetera, um, all of these can just basically be replicated for each schema that we create. Um, so in other words, in, for this example here, for the projects 2024 database, um, we have project one, project two, and project three, um, Angkor Wat, Rome, Athens, respectively. Um, and we are uh, creating those same, that same group of tables within each one of these schemas. It's usually a database per year. This is something that we do quite commonly. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't want the database or the number of schemas in a database to get too large. Um, it starts slowing down and just, you know, it can become a problem if it gets too big. Um, so what we often do is we um, will actually just create a separate year for a, a, a new database for each year. And then within each, we add all of our projects. But this presents problems. It's a very good solution. We do it for a number of clients. But what if you want one day to query all of your test pit data from every project you've ever done? Or... What if you want to know how many ceramic artifacts were collected in 2017? Or more specifically, what if you want to know how many ceramic artifacts were collected in 2017 within a certain municipality by Sarah Parker, one of your staff members? Um, so this is where SQL comes in, right? This is where if everything's stored centrally, or all the, all the project data is stored centrally, now we can run a query. We can say, hey, have we ever found something like this before? Let's go to the database and check. So this is called the centralized data model that we use. And there's this, it, we create a central source for project data. Each data set is cumulative. 
So we have project boundaries, test pits, artifact collection, and any other table, but we only have one version of that table. And every project contributes data to those centralized tables. So that if we ever want to one day go in and say, have we ever done a project on this property before? All we have to do is load the project boundaries layer and we'll see if there's a project boundary that intersects with the property of interest. Project data are filtered by the project ID field for each table. So whenever we add a new row of data um, to any of these tables or another feature on a map, if you prefer thinking of it like that, there's going to be an attribute called project ID. And in that, we are going to name the project. So in that this case, oftentimes what we do is we create a schema per year for projects. And here I'm talking about QGIS projects. So within each one of these projects, 2021, 22, 23, 24 schemas, we are going to be saving QGIS projects. Now, this is a great model. We do it quite a bit, but there are some problems. Um, oftentimes is that it's just going to grow or we want to, what do we do when we want to add additional files or additional layers into each one of these individual projects? So this is the question. What if we want both? What if we want project data stored in the centralized database, but we also want that sort of project by schema set up so we can throw whatever else we get. Now, one thing I know from working with archeologists and from doing my own work in the past is that it, nothing's ever that neat. You are collecting ceramics the same way for every project or stone tools for every project, but there's always gonna be additional layers handed to you. Um, you know, maybe the whoever's managing the project or whoever, whoever hired you to do the project is going to hand you something. And you're going to have to load that in the database. You want it to be available to all of your users somewhere. So this is where we set this up. So we have a central project database that has all of our project data living within a schema called, you guessed it, project underscore data. Um, and then we have project templates are stored centrally in the project database as well. So these are our QGIS projects. We'll actually store them centrally in that project data uh, database um, so that all users can have access to them and replicate those within their individual projects. Now, they may contain non-centralized tables to replicate, which is fine. Um, oftentimes there are some tables that we want to create that where we don't want them to be centralized. So this is where we can be really flexible and we can say, all right, well, some of the tables aren't going to be centralized. Some of the tables are very specific to this project and only this project. And we want to be able to change the structure of the table specific to this project. So that's fine. Um, we give you a template for that table. It gets created within your schema. You have the layer, but you can modify it however you want. So projects are stored per schema in databases named per year. All right, so let me take you through this just so you understand. This is our central data. These are our project schemas. So now what's saved inside of the Anchor Watt project is the QGIS project. But now we also have that flexibility. So when the project manager comes to us and says, hey, I just got this awesome shape file for every I don't know, tree on the property. Um, which would be a lot of trees at Anchor Watt. Um, but anyway, if you if you did get that data set and you loaded it into this schema, you are then going to be able to give grant access to all of the users for this project. It's really quite handy to have. All right, so some thinking points. Um, do you collect and record data the same way for each project? These are the questions that I ask when a client comes to us first and we're talking about a database. We need a database. You say, okay, well, how do you collect stuff? Is it the same all the time? Is it completely different every time? And this is where, um, you know, scoping a project often becomes uh, difficult because we start off by saying, no, we, we do things pretty much the same every time. And then you have to go back and you look at your past 10 projects and realize, oh, shoot, no, we've been doing it differently every time. There's always been a new field added. Do we need that field? Do we not need that field? Um, and this is where there's a lot of thinking that happens. Do you often use the same third-party data for multiple projects? Probably the answer is yes. Um, you're probably using the same parcel data set over and over again. Centralizing this would be great. How much time would it save to centralize all of your project data? 
Um, so I, I have a client that we just implemented and they said, you know what, we're just sitting here and we're re overwriting each other's work all the time. And we're having to go back and redo work and redo work and redo work. And it's becoming a real problem. Centralizing it is now saving time and money. Do you ever have uh, duplicate data causing chaos, confusion, and sadness? Um, this happens a lot where you, you get a map, you produce a map, you're like, isn't this great? Um, but you look at it and you realize, oh, shoot, you're, you, you were using the old parcel data. There was actually a subdivision last year put in here, but it's like, well, I didn't have the new parcel data set. Well, you should have got it. You should have downloaded it off of SharePoint, but you didn't know it was added to SharePoint. Um, if it was in a database, we just cut that out because people are always going to load the data directly from the database. Part two, multi-user editing. Um, QGIS, I'm going to start by saying QGIS and PostGIS have a very long history together, going back to the beginning. Um, you know, QGIS was really created as being sort of like a viewer for PostGIS, um, among other things. But part of it was 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 that, right? To be able to view this uh, data that was being pulled out of this spatial database. Um, so there's a lot of integrations. And if you're a user of another GIS, um, you might not be familiar with a lot of the things that you can do here. And there's tons. And we have a ton of webinars that sort of focus on different things like, you know, attributes forms and multi-user editing and things like this. So you can go into some of our, our material on YouTube if you want to get an idea of other things you can do uh, or just have a you know longer discussion on, on specific items. But multi-user editing allows you to concurrent editing of vector data. Various group roles with different permissions can be defined. Um, the most basic that we'll define is something like, okay, there's read-only users, there's editors, and there's admins. Um, and there's a number of QGIS integrations that are really, really helpful within an enterprise environment. Things like default QGIS symbology. If you want a test pit to always be a black dot on the map, um, you know, you can establish that as the default symbology. And any time a user creates a new test pit and produces a map, it will be that black dot. You can save QGIS projects into Postgres. That is a very handy tool for centralizing everything, but it does come with a few caveats in that, you know, there are problems that can happen. Like anytime you centralize something that, you know, a bunch of people can save over, uh, problems can happen. You can create custom forms. Um, so these are custom attributes forms where you can have things like drop downs and everything. It's really quite handy and layer filtering. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of these. Um, so concurrent editing, this is just kind of a visualization of how this would happen. All right, Sarah on the left um, is going to add a point and is adding a new test pit. And you can see the nice form there also. You can remember that as we get to the form section um, and creates the new form on the Atkins farm project and saves it into the database. Now, Bob Smith turns around, opens up QGIS and loads the test pit uh, data. As he loads the that layer into his map, he sees that new point instantly. Now, there is a little refresh button in QGIS, but the cool thing about working with PostGIS data in it is that you can simply press the refresh button or you can zoom out, pan around, um, and you'll be able to see any of the changes. So let's talk about group roles. Um, so let's just say we have project data and we have a read-only group. Um, and so these are your users that can only read data. So that means they can't edit it, they can't change it. Um, we have an editor group and we have an admin group. What can they do? So the read-only group, when they connect via QGIS to the project data, they can read tables, yes. So that means they can load any table they want into QGIS and, and read it. But can they edit it? No. Can they create or modify tables? By modify tables, I mean things like, you know, add a new column to it or delete a column or rename a column. Um, or create a new data set within the project schema? The answer to that is no, if they have uh, no they have no access to that. Now for the editor group, when they connect to via QGIS, they're able to read tables, they're able to edit existing tables, and they're able to create or modify, but, but they're not able to create or modify tables. Now the admin are different. The admin, as you guessed, Yes, 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 they can do everything. They can create tables, modify tables, um, do anything they want to the project data. So for this reason, we often, if we're just gonna start with these basic groups within your organization, we have to think about who should be part of that read-only group. Well, people who don't really need to edit, people who don't need to contribute data to it, who need to basically just go in, see stuff, maybe extract some information, maybe print a map, 
um, those people can just have read-only access. The editors um, can actually edit the data, right? So this, these are the people who might actually be your project managers or your GIS staff um, who are able to um, go in and uh, edit the tables. We also have an admin group, right? So the admin group, they're the ones who, if you're thinking of within your organization, those are your GIS managers, the people who are really in control. That should be limited um, to maybe only, uh, you know, one or two users within your organization. So let's talk about default GIS symbology. Um, so QGIS symbology can be saved into Postgres. It's really quite handy. Whenever you open up the layer properties, you can press style, save as default data source database. And this will save your, your style directly into your uh, database. Um, it's really quite nice because you can, um, you can actually save a number of different styles um, within your, your database for each layer. So you can save the default one and say, okay, by default, I want it to be a green line. Um, but if you, um, if you want to save another one and say, well, we also want sort of like a grayscale version that we can use, um, you can save those as well. So you can save multiple symbology per layer. So um, the default symbology can be defined for each layer, which is quite nice. And it's stored in a central table in the public schema called layer styles. And what's really cool about this, and it's hard to wrap your brain around it until you actually use a database, but we can establish the same layer styles, or sorry, the same permissions on that layer styles table. Um, and when we do that, we're able to um, control who can actually create styles, modify styles, save styles. Um, and, and it's really quite a powerful tool within an enterprise environment. Um, so I think I showed you already, but like it, when I load a layer, um, it's automatically styled, right? So it's actually in here. If I go to properties and I go into symbology, and if I wanted to change it to being a different color, let's say I wanted it to be blue suddenly, all I have to do is go into the, the properties and go um, save, save as default. I'm not going to do it, but data source database. And it would ask me, do you want to, you know, replace it? And I can do that. Um, so yeah, very handy tool um, with an enterprise environment. Okay, so you could save QGIS projects in Postgres as well. Um, so QGIS has the ability to centralize projects within the database. Um, projects are saved in the QGIS projects table within each schema. So if you do save it, you can sort of save the project within a schema in your database. The minute you do that, um, you're able to, um, it creates that table within the schema, but you can also establish permissions on that. So just like you did with the styles, you can say, all right, I'm going to save this project to this specific schema, but nobody can have access to it. They can just have read-only access to it. Nobody can save it. We do that a lot in the GIS database. So the GIS, like the data warehouse database with all the third-party data, we might create a maps map templates within that, that project. Um, but we don't want people to overwrite this stuff. So we, we establish read-only permission on that QGIS projects table. So saving is done uh, via the top menu, projects, save to Postgres. Um, this just allows you to save directly into the database. And then it shows up where I showed you uh, in QGIS. Access to save projects can be controlled like any other database object, as I said. But this is the thing that I was mentioning before, the last save wins. Um, so this is the part where this act actually does not act like, or sorry, it does act like a file system, right? If you have two people opening up the same project at the same time, and one presses save, and then the other one presses save, um, the last one who press save is going to win. So if you added a whole bunch of things to a project, but press save, and then the other person press save, your changes are gone. But keep in mind, I'm talking about just the QGIS project. I'm not talking about the data. If you added more, um, if you add more test pits and more things like this, uh, it is not going to be a problem because those changes will actually save directly into those tables. Whereas the projects themselves um, is, is just a, a, a row of data that's being saved into the database table. Custom forms. Um, this is really handy. QGIS supports the creation of complex input forms for any spatial layer. Attributes forms are saved to the layer symbology, which is saved to the database. 
So forms are actually part of that symbology um, within QGIS. So as you save that default symbology to the database, it saves it with the form. To give you an idea of what I mean by this. The test pit data has a default form associated with it. So if I do load the test pit data, and I was to go in and I was going to add a new point, automatically this form appears with our list of projects, um, you know, our data assessed, and so on. All right. So you can have various input elements in a form. You saw a bunch of them in this in that brief little demo. You can have drop down menus, text input, numeric input. Um, there's a dates picker, Boolean also supports uh, tabbed input for conditional logic, um, which is quite handy. Um, so you can actually create, you can actually create um, uh, different tabs within your form. And based on if somebody clicks a certain Boolean or something, um, you'll that will can actually open or close um, uh, different tabs within the interface. Layer filtering. Um, this is a really, really handy uh, feature to have. Uh, we can filter rows, as I said, we'll filter rows by like project ID or something like that. Um, it's really quite handy uh, because we can filter all the layers that are within the, the, the application. And I'll give you a little demo of what I mean by this. Um, one of the things that's nice about this is that QGIS integration with PostGIS makes this very, very fast. Um, so as we establish these filters, um, it's not taking, you know, a ton of time to, to load them. So we've done a lot of tests with this, with like, you know, having a table with, you know, millions and millions and millions of points, but we want to filter it so that only three points show up on the map. It's not going to go and refilter all those points as it, as it goes through. It's simply going to do this. It does it quite quickly and quite elegantly um, within the front end. So. Um, the other thing that's nice when we uh, filter layers is we often establish the default value. And I do this so that if you add a new point to the map, if you're within a specific project, automatically it's going to be associated with that project. So there's a couple of things that I do. One, I set the default value. So here you see the default value set to 77, which just refers to the ID field um, in, a, in a related table. And then we set editable to be off. And now when we go to add a new point on the map, in this case, we're in the project for the Bennett Farm project, um, automatically that's selected and it's and it's turned off. When we take that editable off within the um, attributes form settings, um, you can't actually edit that value. So um, those three things, once we do it, um, uh, it, it gives us a lot of control over how we manage a project. Let me show you what I mean. Um, so if I open up a specific project here, which is the Peter's Farm projects, I have these filters in place. Show you what I mean. Okay, so here's the Peter's project. If I go into the test pit now and I add a point, automatically I see the Peter's Farm project here. I can't change this value. Um, so this means that if anybody is working within this QGIS project, automatically any new test pit that they add is going to be associated with the correct project. Okay. Some thinking points. Um, so this is another question that I ask people right away when we're talking about moving into a database is what group roles might exist in your company, project, organization? Are there different departments? Are there different permission levels? Are there different project roles? Um, so we have to give it some thought. What's the sort of natural division within your, your company or organization? Um, and how can we then create or recreate those roles um, within the database and assign different permissions to each? How would a multi-user editing environment benefit your, your work? Uh, would it streamline processes, save time and money? Um, would it reduce the risk of data loss? How would data centralization improve your ability to complete projects, report on prog progress, and extract meaningful data? So this comes back to that ability to search through all of your data and say, 
I'm looking for uh, an, you know, an arrowhead that sort of looks like this. I don't think I've seen one. I think I saw one back in 2016. We did some project out in the middle of nowhere. And I don't remember, but I, I want to find something that looks like this. If you have everything in one database, you're able to easily go back and search through all of those things. All right, we're going to make it through here. I'm going to go through GeoServer. I realize I'm sort of dabbling a bit. So I'm going to try to make it through the rest of this a little quickly. GeoServer integration. Archaeologists produce and use many types of raster data during the research process. So previously we were talking about vector data. Now we're talking about raster data specifically. Um, Georeferencing is something that all of my archaeology clients do quite a bit. They're always getting old historic maps, plans, aerial photographs, and these can be georeferenced really easily using QGIS. Um, the QGIS georeferencing tool works really well. Um, if you haven't, there in one of our courses, it's QG, um, Advanced QGIS 1. There's a whole section on georeferencing. Um, so if, if that's something that interests you and you just want to have a good example of doing that, that course is available um, if you want to give that a go. So the other thing uh, that we're collecting a lot of data for are UAV-derived data products. Um, so we're talking orthomosaics, DTMs, DSMs, LIDAR, GPR. Um, GPR specifically is something that's really, people are collecting a lot of data lately. Um, and this needs to be stored, this needs to be shared, it needs to be used within projects. So I'm gonna show you how we do this. So how do you share raster data with office staff, field staff, and maybe even clients? So again, we look at all of the data that our client has, and we often ask, you know, what are you doing with this? Who needs to have access to it? How should they have access to it? Um, you know, they have aerial photos, satellite data, UAV derived, derived orthos, DEMs, and so on. So they'll share these data through GeoServer. Um, and when they sh we share it through GeoServer, we're then able to serve it out as a WMS uh, service. When it's shared out, this goes out to QGIS. This is the, the easiest way it can go out to LunaMap as well. Um, and it can also go out to any other application that supports WMS. So if you're thinking of like, you know, we've done connections to ArcGIS online, we've done connections to people who are using whatever Esri desktop people are using lately. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, other other desktop GIS applications that support WMS, we can serve it out. This is just WMS. You can have a WMTS tile if you want to cache things um, on the geo server. And there's a number of other just WCS. There's a double of a, a number of other solutions out there. But some of the main advantages of using this is, you know, it's a common data source for all users. It's common symbol symbology for every layer. Um, it's widely supported. Uh, and you can serve as many layers as you can store. It's also really easy to locate layers. If you're looking for something, you're like, oh, I'm looking for the plans for London Waterworks from 18, what does it say, 1893 or whatever. Um, you can easily just search for that within the data catalog within QGIS and easily find the layer. So some thinking points. Um, do your end users need to analyze rasters or simply view them? Um, so there's a big difference here, and I talk to clients a lot about this, and we don't really have a very, you know, I don't think there's a very good solution. You just need to have to have a strategy for this. Um, if all you want to do is view raster data, load them into your maps, serve them out, uh, this geo server approach is perfect. We do it with almost every single one of our clients who has have raster data, aerial photos, whatever they have. Um, we do this with geo server. But if we want to do some analysis on it, you're still going to re rely on your file system. And you still have to have a way of storing these things and a method. Um, so one of the problems that uh, I, we get this all the time is a user is going to go open up a project that was saved in QGIS and they get this unavailable layer error in QGIS because someone loaded imagery from their own desktop instead of a central source. This solves that problem. Um, this means that all of your imagery is going to be pulled from a centralized location and loaded into your QGIS project. When your QGIS project is then saved within Postgres, happiness happens. So this is what it really comes down to. Do you have a raster data management strategy um, for your organization? Where is stuff stored? How is it stored? What format is it stored in? Who produced it? Uh, do you have metadata associated with these data sets? Uh, this is stuff you have to think about. All right, print composer. I'm going to run through this quickly, but this is a fun one. 
Um, all right, so maps are probably the most common output in archaeology. Maps, graphs, everything. What if we could incorporate them all into one thing? Um, what's really nice is that archaeologists produce a lot of maps. They use a lot of maps. They georeference a lot of maps. Um, and it's actually the thing that got me into GIS was I was working in archaeology and I got exposed to this world. And I thought, this is really cool. Let's do a deep dive into this, you know. 10 years or so later, 12 years later, um, you know, I'm heavily into it. And um, what's really nice about QGIS is that it has so many tools to create really good cartographic products. Um, the layout manager is wonderful in, in, in QGIS. It allows you to create a number of different uh, layouts within a project. So you can have one QGIS project, but you can have innumerable layouts for that project. And they're all saved within the project so that you save share one project and people will have access to all of these different layouts. So if we had one for artifact distribution, site boundaries, site topography, soil and geology, you could centralize all those data sets, all those uh, map layouts. Um, templates can be exported or centralized and centralized. Um, so you, if you want, you can just export these templates and save them within your file system. Um, or as I often do, I just save it into a template schema in PostGIS and I make it read only for all staff members. And then they have access to all of these uh, layouts. So we just have a QGIS project that you can replicate for each of your subsequent projects. Um, there's not expensive, it's supposed to say expansive tools for cartographic designs. They're not expensive. They're actually free. Um, multiple maps with legends, north arrows, et cetera, text, uh, graphics, tables, charts, uh, elevation profiles. You can even add HTML boxes um, within your maps. And again, they're expansive, not expensive. Um, QGIS Layout Manager is great. Um, you can actually create uh, Atlas functionality uh, as well. Um, so if you wanted to, let's just say, have your uh, individual projects um, and have a map for each project area, you could have hundreds of these and you want to create a PDF that shows you the boundaries. You can use the Atlas functionality and you can have the coverage layer set to the project areas. And you're then able to create in, you know, maps for every single one of your projects and they're consistent and they look the same. Um, you can export either a single map from this atlas or you can export the whole thing as a, P as a single PDF. Uh, you can easily flip between projects. So up here in the uh, top right, you can just flip back and forth between uh, different projects and export as needed. All right, last one. Um, this is where it gets kind of cool. Um, and we're kind of excited about this. So I want to show you a little bit. So we've already looked at kind of these projects, right? And I'll just take just a few minutes. I just want to show you kind of how uh, Lunamap works. So everything, as I said, that we're looking at here is living within one centralized database. Um, and if we go into Lunamap, this is our Lunamap application, we can log in. And when we do so, we get access to the same layers. And what you're looking at right now is you're looking at just the project areas uh, layer. And this is pulled directly from the database. Um, so if we do zoom in um, and turn on our identify tool for the project areas, you know, we can click on these individual projects and get the information um, about this project. Um, <clears throat> what's nice about Lunamap is that we can manage different workspaces. Uh, so you can create a different workspace for each one of your clients. So if you work with, you know, BC Hydro or something, um, you can have a BC Hydro um, uh, workspace save all of their projects into individual maps. So within a workspace, you can easily flip between different maps. I can create different ones right here. So I'm going to flip over. It's just asked me to save. I can flip to the Bennett Farm project. And when I do so, I have a list of, you know, I can load all the artifacts that were collected um, on that property. I can show any test pits. There was only one that was done on this property. And I can also load the actual survey grid um, if I want, which is quite tight. Uh, I think it's a 500 meter survey grid. Um, <clears throat> but this is really quite handy because we can load the additional layers too. So we could easily load all of those third party data sets. We can load the hydrology data sets. We can load the Lawton concession data set, any parcel data sets you have. Um, all of that can be loaded directly onto this map as well. And we can expose it to different, um, different clients or users internally. Uh, and it's really easy to go through and start a new project. Um, one of the things I, I sort of pushed for our dev team to do was um, if we we're going to load the, uh, 
a project like this, I wanted to have the, the feel of like a desktop environment where you can just do a save as. So this is the Martin Farm uh, project. I can easily just do this and call this um, Martin Farm project. And I'm going to share this with the workspace so that everybody who sort of logs in is going to be able to see this. So now the Martin Farm is this is it. Um, and I can flip between, you know, the Bennett Farm, the Martin Farm, or I can flip between seeing all of our farms. Uh, managing this stuff is also super easy. We're pulling the data from, from the database and we're loading it directly into um, LunaNet. We can easily go in if we want to, and we can add new layers within PostGIS. And the minute you add it within PostGIS, it's visible on the map. Um, so that's quite a handy uh, process because it allows you to edit and then see those results in real time um, on the web map. Now, I give my email address at the end of this. If anybody wants a more thorough uh, demo of Luna Map or any of this, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, when you're doing a webinar like this, it's hard to actually get through all this material and show you every single little bit and piece um, of the applications. All right, so a couple of take home points for our conclusion. Centralizing raster and vector data has many benefits, notably, notably significant cost savings through better data management. Um, never allow multi-user editing in a file-based GIS. It's always a recipe for disaster. Um, I can't tell you how many times this has happened where um, users do come in and say, oh, shoot, you know, somebody saved over work that I did, or we lost all of this work, or the file's gone and the backup wasn't done since Tuesday or something. Um, with a database, we're able to backup daily and just restore data quite easily. GeoServer is an excellent option for sharing raster data. Um, it's just a, a great way of sharing data um, via QGIS or via any other application. Uh, it's a great place just to centralize all of this and, and give your all of your users internally or maybe some externally um, just access to a whole catalog of raster data. Uh, QGIS has an excellent print layout manager. Um, if you haven't used this a lot, go into the documentation, take a course, um, uh, try it out, try to create um, um, more exciting maps. Again, look at things like using that uh, uh, elevation profile within the map layout. I think I'm going to do a webinar in, in the coming months on the print layout because increasingly it's something that, that people are using quite a bit more. Um, and there's a lot of features that I don't think a lot of people know are there. Um, so leverage this. And the big thing here is standardize your cartographic outputs. Um, and, and QGIS is, gives you a lot of great tools in order to do this. Luna Map is a great way to share GIS data with non-GIS users, clients, uh, and other par project participants. Um, it really is, I love web GIS. This is what reason why we build so many web GIS applications for, for a number of different clients around the world is that um, it's just such a great way of giving people access to this without having them to, you know, install a specific application and load data, which can be quite daunting to some. Okay, so C. Patterson at lunageo.com, please reach out. Um, if you have any questions, comments, um, I would love to hear from you. Um, I put a lot of effort into putting these uh, webinars together, and I really hope that they're helpful. I hope it gives you something to think about as you go back to uh, think about your work. Um, but if there's something I didn't cover, if there's additional questions you have, reach out. Um, if you want to connect and do a, uh, a demo of Luna Map or see a few more things within the database, um, I can also send you a link um, to have a meeting with me. Uh, we can set that up and just have a little one-on-one -on -one meeting and chat through some of these questions that you have. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you for coming and staying for the whole thing. Um, and, and this video will be shared soon online. You'll be able to access it. Thank you. Bye.